Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the White Bull Trial Session, Filmmakers and Their Films with Robert Bresson. So Raghavinder Sir will be guiding us throughout the session and he'll be doing the presentation. So over to you, sir. No, uh, Robert Bresson is a very extremely difficult filmmaker. He's one of the most difficult of all time, okay? So the, he doesn't have much of a following except in a kind of, you know, it's a small circle. He, he has, a, I mean, obviously his greatness is acknowledged. So it's so difficult that in, uh, in America, for instance, uh, not many people uh, relish his, his, his kind of cinema. In fact, I would say that if you're only brought up on Hollywood, you won't understand him at all. If you're, even if you're brought up on Indian cinema, it's even more difficult to, uh, to make sense of uh, Bresson, okay. Now, uh, one of the things about Bresson is that his method is very exact, unlike some other. See, for example, um, when you say exact, that means every single thing makes, uh, uh, there is a particular reason for doing something. Every single thing has a purpose, okay. It's, it's, uh, for example, you take something like Godard, right? You take something like Godard. Godard is not an exact filmmaker at all, okay. In fact, the story goes that uh, very often when the sets were ready and he was supposed to be, should, would be sitting there writing the screenplay, Godard, it says to say that about Godard, that, uh, he, I mean, his thing was he used to rely on the miracles of the moment at some point, right? You expect you're going to shoot something, okay, you're going to shoot something, you're planning something, you don't know how you're going to go about it, but somewhere in the process, some improvisation will happen, something will happen. So by and large, you could say that the that the French New Wave, by and large, were not exact filmmakers. Godard was not. Romer, because of a lot of uh, a lot of improvisation, was not a very not an exact filmmaker at all. Okay, but uh, Bresson is a different thing. He is uh, extremely extremely exact, and he had he brought out this book called Notes of on Cinematography or no, Notes on Cinematography, where he actually lays down the principles as one line statement. Right, he does that. So, you, of course, it's, again, that's uh, not exactly not exactly illuminating in the sense it's difficult. For example, one of the things he says talks about Debussy, the piano. Okay, he says Debussy used to play no, play the piano with the lid down. Right. Now the question is, what does that mean exactly? That uh, that lid down means that it's, it's, it's all in the head kind of thing. So, Preston doesn't show too much in his cinema. Yeah, you yeah, can see me, no? Right. Okay. All right. He doesn't show too much in his movies. He doesn't, in fact, um, it's, uh, so the, what has happened is that he's by and large taken to be a Christian filmmaker. Bresson is generally taken to be a very Christian filmmaker. And he's called Jansenist. I don't know what that means. J-A-N-S-E-N-I-S-T. -E but I'm not very, shall we say, happy with this Christian filmmaker thing. Simply because if you're such a Christian filmmaker, what about the rest of us who generally have some sense of uh, world literature and what? Obviously, some exposure to the Western uh, thing of literature, cinema, and art painting, and all that thing is necessary, but not, shall we say, commitment to that really Christian religion in any way. Okay, it's like a political filmmaker. Now, does the fact that Bresson is a, is a Christian filmmaker make him especially great? What exactly is the thing? What are the virtues of a Christian filmmaker? Is the kind of thing, right? So. My point is, if you're going to be a political filmmaker, being a Marxist is no indication that you're a great filmmaker, right? Similarly, being Christian is no indication that you're not. We're not really interested in why you're Christian. We're interested in the fact that he's great. Why? What makes him great? What is his uh, particular contribution to cinema is what really interests us. So that is the basic thing. So, not, not only that, in the, in, the, in a cosmopolitan world with the exposure to no exposure to the, to the liberal thought, to the latest in world thought. You want to be exposure to as much to as many different uh, streams, to as many different threads as possible for, for that and for, for you to benefit from that, right? So the question is, so the question is, why should we be look at this guy, look at uh, Bresson? I think in FDI, they would have taught you in the Christian way, right? You were a student of FDI, they'll teach you in the Christian way. He's a Christian filmmaker, he's Jansen, he's this, 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 that, no, that right? doesn't really interest me. So I've tried to look at his films closely, what they could make from whatever I have read, from whatever I have seen, not only of Bresson, but also of literature and all that, okay? 
Now, I just had a few couple of questions, sir, related to Christian yeah. filmmakers. Uh, so, I mean, <clears throat> there are a few films which are considered very religious, like Passion of Christ or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, when his films are spoken about, you know, we take spirituality into consideration. And if we see films like, you know, Trial of Joan of Arc or even The Country Priest, you know, it's it's more of a conversational based rather than you know showing that the voice of God or voice yeah, of no, no, he's Christ. Yeah, no, he's not. He's not a, but, what do you say, a, so, so, is a religious person at all. And also, so, I'm a little. You see, this is a question of uh, spiritual, right? Yeah. See, yeah. What happens with this word spiritual is people sort of are generally seduced into some kind of uh, you know into some kind of uh, shall we say. Um, into it, lulled into some kind of passivity by this word spiritual, doesn't mean anything, you know. Yeah. So I'll try to talk about him as a spiritual filmmaker to make some sense of what that means in his context. For example, yeah. they use the word spiritual even to, uh, in regard to Tarkovsky, right? Yes. Okay. yes. Now, what is the similarity between Tarkovsky and Bresson? Almost nothing. Okay, almost nothing. If both are spiritual, they're very different from each other. Right, I want to make that point, right? So the question is that what exactly is Bresson's spirituality? But the point is this, he is not trying to propagate Christian values at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is no that, that's a, that kind of sense. That you have, like, for example, Ben Hur. You look at something like Ben Hur. Yeah. Obviously, there are Christian values propagated in Ben Hur, right? Yeah. yeah. It's some kind of, I mean, it's obviously this thing of faith and all that. It's obviously got some Christian virtues which are they're being uh, shown there. And uh, obviously, it's, it's some kind of, uh, it's almost in some sense propagandist in some sense. It's a religious thing of some sort, right? The Bresa is not like that. Okay. He's dealing with something which are important Christianity. That doesn't mean it's Christian in that sense. See, for example, let's take something like uh, sin, let us take something like redemption, redemption, let us take something like evil. Now, these things should matter, sir, matter to all of us, regardless of religion, right? Okay. Right. If you are uh, exposed to the world, if you are exposed to world uh, philosophical issues in the world, or redemption, for instance, why is it that, uh, that uh, an atheist cannot believe in redemption? Okay, what is redemption? You've had a life full of doubt, you've not been able to do anything. At some particular point, there's some fulfillment, you're able to overcome all that. Okay, that will be redemption. I think these are not really, shall we say, exclusive from uh, theism, atheism. I don't think they're really dependent on that. You get my point? Okay. So the question is, and I will tell you that this thing of moral values, right? You need not be a believer in God to uh, ascribe to moral values. They exist in themselves. They are not necessarily uh, connected to religion in any way. Okay. Yeah. But what has happened in the world today is that gen generally there is some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, uh, by which the people of all religions generally ascribe to certain moral values. What is right? What is wrong? What is good? What is bad? These things. Evil, for instance. If you start believing in evil outside you in the form of devils or that sort of thing, that uh, people may not believe, but the point that is good, that is bad, and there is uh, I mean, there is uh, wanton bad from certain certain sources is also without without motivation is also understood and seen by people. So that being the case, this question of making him a religious person is not doesn't seem to me particularly you know useful to me. Okay. Now we have to accept the fact that as you as you go higher and higher in, in terms of into deeper and deeper into the appreciation of art, appreciation of cinema, appreciation of literature, you find that the more philosophical questions, the deeper, the more difficult questions are asked in the West by and large, Western philosophy and all that. They are, they are deeper questions. Hollywood, for example, is a little lower. Indian cinema is even lower, the kind of generally, I mean, by, by and large, the lower in the sense that I mean, less, less difficult questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that the most difficult questions in terms of uh, in terms of you know psychological and whatever these philosophical issues about the world about the, about reality and all these are more asked i mean when asked even in hinduism may ask questions about uh, reality and all that but they are not posed as problems mm -hmm. okay they are more given as answers in some way they are more beliefs in some way they do not pose as problems as exploration through thought through that kind of thing right yeah. okay now uh, Bresson is called spiritual. Tarkovsky is also called spiritual. I'm not happy with the term spiritual. It's not something I would uh, I would understand what it means. But I'll try since it's used so often with relation to 
express now i will try to explain it in some way i'll try to look at it in some way normally like you know compared to animals don't have a higher purpose but we humans you know believe in higher purpose and stuff those concepts like that so my question is you know do they really exist or is it in the mind of the human is there a reality as such see the, the point is that you have a mind right that mind has to be used for something you have to understand your place how you came came into the world and you need explanations for this and you need explanations you speculate it has to be speculative we cannot take any word of anybody as the ultimate thing so the question is that philosophy is basically to probe your uh, issues in the world not as belief but as in as inquiry as uh, you know in creativity some kind of you know i my own uh, thing about uh, about uh, creativity like literature and cinema is your basically your divinity of man in some sense man man has divinity in him in the sense that uh, when when i say divinity i mean that you are capable of creating the way god created i'm saying the word god i mean as an atheist i'm saying a god when you say god created though it was created by somebody by the creator it is not that he has consciousness or anything the question is man is replicating the creator in some way by creating if, uh, if god created trees human beings animals planets uh, clouds rain water fire it created all this man created art literature okay that kind of thing So you generally try to replicate God in some way by creating on your own. So this is basically it. And the whole purpose of when we are exploring cinema is to play God in some way to understand why did this man create this? What exactly is this? It's in relation to the larger creation, but it's all involved in the thing of like the understanding what uh, the world is, God's created world. I mean, when I say God, when I use the word God, I am speaking as an atheist that whatever, whatever is the whatever. It is the fact that it led us to creation is a fact. Okay, yeah. what it means, yeah. what is the thing? Does it have a law, law? Does it have an order? Is there a human missing? Is humanity favored? All these are issues, right? These yeah. are the issues that you would like to go, like to probe. And these are, and I think Western philosophy has gone very deep into it, right? From the Greeks, it's gone very deep into it in terms of probing through 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 human means, mm-hmm. humanly widely acceptable means like argument. Okay, yeah. like experimentation, the like speculation. Okay, these are things which are very different from belief, right? Yeah. From yeah. belief and dogma, they are completely different from belief and dogma, because the belief and dogma are accessible only to say belief is accessible, you know, to mystics and that sort of thing who really understand that. I cannot become a mystic just like that. Whereas uh, language, okay, through which philosophy is uh, expounded, through which when I say philosophy, I mean reason through reason. Is mm-hmm. expounded. It is always accessible to everybody who knows the language. You just have to use your mind. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Like the road of access is accessible, accessible to everybody, provided they make the effort. Kind of thing. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go along yeah. to the next slide. Can we? Okay. Some characteristics of Breton films. Okay. Now the point is, that I'll, I'll tell you something. One of the things is he hardly uses music. Okay. I'll, one by one, and I'll be to speculate on what it is. he doesn't use music in his later movie he stops music altogether okay so he uses sounds natural sounds he uses for example in uh, in uh, the trial of john of arc the scratching of a pen okay that sort of thing okay so the whole thing the braying of a donkey you know how that balthas are that sort of thing right he uses new hardly uses music and later he stops altogether in uh, balthas are he uses i think uh, um i think i forget who the music at the beginning piano music chopin i am not so sure i think it's chopin also okay he doesn't use music at all and uh, uh, then the second thing actors he doesn't make his actors act he calls them models he puts them in roles he put places them in roles he doesn't make them act he just sort of makes them go through the roles go through the motions in some way uses them again and again in order to achieve some kind of truth the reason he does this is okay that actors he wants it so spare what 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 is normally called minimalism minimalist that so spare done the, with so little thing and so close to you know the truth in some way that the actors have this tendency to add things right if you put robert de niro in a spiritual role robert de niro will give you robert de niro before he gives you spirituality right so the question is that actors would first uh, would add a lot of noise the same way music would impose the music what what music music does is it imposes a certain thing and it's from somebody else right some other person has got some idea he puts music into it 
it approximate music has a tendency to approximate whereas uh, this effort this effect is okay is that effect okay no we we'll use some other music and he produces some other music this is closer but basically it's approximate and reson does not want approximation he seems to want exact uh, solutions to everything right that is the reason he doesn't use uh, he doesn't uh, use uh, um, uh, actors the people he uses are called models he calls them models they fit into the the roles they are not actors in any way i think he's rarely used actors of any repute i think dominic sanda he used in um, in uh, gentle creature gentle woman but i don't think he's used as far as i know he's not used any well known faces or any well known thing in any of his movies okay he does not use faces this is important he does not use close ups of faces with bergman would use only close ups of faces there are a lot of like for example you look at the uh, passion of jono wark of karl dreyer okay dreyer's uh, uh, jono wark uses faces all the time right close ups of faces uh, this guy bresso uses hands and feet close up of hands and feet you have any idea why what do you think is the reason for using hands and feet what do you think is uh, you have some idea what is it that faces have that hands and hands and feet don't have Or that, or all the other way around. What do hands and feet have that the faces uh, don't have? Uh, as far as I have read, so he wants to create a new language which is different from theater. You know? Yeah, I, yeah, that's true. But uh, in theater, you don't have close-ups. Mm -hmm. You can't have close-ups in theater, right? See, the yeah. point is this, right? Okay, faces can be assigned to individuals. Okay. hands and feet cannot be assigned to individuals so if you have for example robert de niro's face okay is robert de niro's face okay if you were to if if robert de niro was playing jesus christ it would be robert de niro's face will be assigned to robert de niro whereas if you take robert de niro's hands we don't know what robert de niro's hands are right like, like right okay Very so the question is hands and feet are not assignable Can you understand that thing? They're not assignable to individuals. So if you say, for example, for example, if you say John Wark's hands and feet, right? Yeah. Those hands and feet cannot be assigned. We we do not know what John looked like, right? Mm -hmm. But as you have somebody that one in uh, fashion of John Wark, fashion of John Wark, Carl Dreyer's thing, that the woman's face is that woman actress's face, and not only that, faces are self-conscious. You get me? Mm -hmm. Okay. they conscious of themselves he is trying to achieve some kind of thing without that self consciousness he wants the hands and feet because they're not assigned to be those of jonova you get me yeah. okay since they're not assigned any hands and feet could be jonova there's yeah. a great line from borges uh, the argentine writer i don't know if you've heard of him one of yeah. my favorite he's got this thing like a hand okay a hand passing you uh, passing you change at the ticket window could mm -hmm. be those that are once nailed to the cross okay and you may not know it okay <laughs> so the question is okay jesus christ everybody has some sense of what jesus christ whether it's true or not is not the point but hands hands of the man in the window is could be those of jesus christ right yeah. so that that is what the bresso i think is playing with he's trying to he's trying to use that uh, that notion right that is a very important thing for the for uh, bresso okay so then uh, that that's why he uses hands and feet he uses natural sounds once again again you know his basic thing is to remove he says what you what you need not show don't show okay so what happens is he will not show violence in his films there is a murder he will not show it he'll show him wiping a uh, washing a knife or something like that okay that's what he will show he will not show you a murder and the whole thing is he seems to be doing films in some kind of visual shorthand they seem to be missing elements in the middle Okay, like you are you are missing elements in the middle. A happens, then C happens, but B will not be shown. This he happens. That film after film after film he does this. So the question is, you have jumped it. If, for example, you take uh, this uh, thing of uh, condemned man escape. You take condemned man escape. Okay, A man escape. That first thing is there. He is trying to get out of the car. Right, opening shot. He is trying to get get out of the car. He is trying to handle. He is trying to move. then uh, i think he makes some effort and he's pulled back and then next scene is shown uh, bleeding he's got a bandage he's inside so he's been beaten up savagely beaten up but he won't show you that it 
it's enough for you to know that this man was beaten up as a, as a result of which he's been severely injured, but he's there, he's still alive. That's the point he wants to make. He's not going to build up on the drama of that. Okay. Yeah. See, let us understand certain things. He is not going to give you spectacle. You know, what happens yeah. in cinema is, a lot of cinema, I think majority of cinema, there is, he's not com- simply communicating, there's an element of spectacle in which you get involved. Anticipating yeah. this, participating in the violence and that. He, he wants to remove that and make it completely, you know, give you exactly what he wants to give. So that is a kind of thing. Okay. So, so, but also, you know, when you took that example, is there also a possibility that he doesn't want to show violence that he's beating, like getting beaten up? Let me agree. I'll tell you, the, tell you this, that uh, if you actually look at the movies, I mean, if you look at something like, uh, like, uh, Mushet, okay. You look at something like Ahazad Balthazar, they're extremely violent in, 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 in psychologically violent. The kind of things that happen in these films are extremely disturbing, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like Bergman. Bergman, as you know, there's a certain uh, you know horror in uh, Bergman. Mm-hmm. The Bergman is a sort of, I do it, even repulsive sometimes. I'm repulsed by the violence, the Bergman's violence. This guy is not trying to do that. He's not trying to do that. So the, the, it is violent in a certain way, but he wants that impact on you, okay? Not as a revulsion, not as uh, what is the word? Uh, not as you know, it is. It's not a brutal. It's not a physical thing, okay? You have to give, mm-hmm. uh, kind of give you a sense of the of the deeper mental uh, thing. He's not giving you that physical revulsion kind of thing. So that's so generally that though they are extremely violent in some sense, of what kind of things happen? Cruelty, for instance. Extremely cruel Breton films, okay? Yeah. The question is, how do you show that cruelty? It's extremely cruel, okay? Mm-hmm. He's not cruel like Bergman is cruel, also very yeah. cruel filmmaker, right? His, his cruelty is of a different sort. Balthazar, should I mean, tell you, it's an extremely cruel film. Everybody is cruel to everybody else than Balthazar. Mm-hmm. Even Mari is cruel. We'll yeah. discuss that a little later, okay? The important thing is, he is against ex- explaining things. In fact, one of his statements was, okay, don't show only things that you can explain. There's so much, too much in the world which you can't explain. Do not rely on explanation. Show things that you can't. Which I think his last two films he went for maximum last two or three movies. Something like Gentle Creature and more than that, uh, this uh, large Jean. I think he went to that level of not being able, not explaining at all in the sense why people do certain things. See, the stories. When you say he's a difficult filmmaker, his stories are always very clear. Okay. You can fully understand his stories, but the question is you don't understand what those stories mean, what is what it's going, why people behave in certain ways, the meaning of that story. Okay. Now, as far as I can make out, when you deal with inner self of people, right, there are three possible ways of dealing with it. One is uh, one is uh, behavior. What is behavior? Okay. What is let's take behavior and psychology. What is the difference between behavior and psychology? Behavior is outward manifestation, right? If you take filmmakers, if you take Romer, I don't know if you see Romer, have you? I don't know. Uh, sometime I'll do Romer also. Romer is behavior. Romer films are always behavior, right? So the question is why a person is doing this? And there's no explanation for that. There are body language, what they say, the kind of things that is improvisation, but basically it's dealing with behavior. Bergman is closer to psychology. There are explanations, inner things, inner feelings, and that sort of thing. It goes deep into feelings. What are the things of feelings? Why is a person feeling hatred? What is a person? So there is a, like, for example, you take something like Rise and Whispers. I, I won't mention the scene. It's a little too much. So the question is the kind of the kind of violence that you have in Cries and Whispers or you have the kind of violence that you have in uh, Teens from a Marriage, for instance, man, woman, violence kind of thing. It is, you, you can generally get a sense of what it's about. Revulsion of the opposite sex, the revulsion of physical contact, that sort of thing, right? Okay. A certain physical revulsion. Now, these are still in the realm of psychology. Okay. Romer will not do that. He is in the realm of behavior. Okay. He will not touch it. He is in the realm of behavior. Um, Bergman is more in the realm of psychology. Bresson, here I would use the word spiritual. He is in the realm of the soul. Right. People do things. Okay. People, what is the psychology? Uh, I mean, we'll come to this later. What is the psychology of, uh, for example, Gerard in. Uh, Ahazad Balthazar. You know, Gerard is one of the most evil characters. Gerard is that guy, the choir singer. Okay. Yeah. He probably, I mean, you will rarely find a more evil person in cinema, in the whole of cinema, 
then uh, this Gerard in uh, Ahazar Balthazar. Okay, it's extremely evil. There's no other word would describe. If we talk about Ahazar Balthazar, I talk about uh, Gerard. He is, I mean, a, absolutely evil character. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't have anything. He sings in a choir. I mean, you know, when you talk about Christian filmmaker, why, you know, should you put uh, what do you say, an evil person like Gerard in a choir? Why put him in a choir? Why is he singing in a church? If you, you know, the, I mean, uh, if, if you want to make the point that why, why do you associate Christianity and being in the church very specifically with the uh, evil? Yeah. Okay, why do that, right? So the question is, they don't want to look at this. He's, he's a choir singer and he's such a dirty guy. I mean, I, I, I'm not uh, sort of makes your flesh crawl and he doesn't really, nothing is shown there. He's not like Bergman's yeah. uh, evil people. Bergman also has got wicked people, but the point is, this guy is really, you know, See the, what, what the kind of things he does, unmotivated, without any expectation of benefit or anything, that sort of thing, right? So this I would call spiritual in some sense, okay? Why people act in certain ways have to do with their inner souls in some way, okay? It's not, you know, it's not like a good man thing in uh, like Hindi cinema or Indian cinema where uh, like uh, the evil capitalist in the art cinema or the evil uh, money lender in uh, popular cinema, we don't mean that. I mean, this is individually, well, even at the individual level, right? Not a type at all. At the individual level. Why people choose to do certain things unmotivated, simply the relishing, the relishing is the thought of causing pain, of doing something, okay? That 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 I would see as spiritual, right? So this character, that is spiritual because it is not based on psychology. It is not motivated, right? When you talk about unmotivated evil, okay, unmotivated evil, what is that exactly? You're not dealing with, uh, shall we say, something like... Uh, uh, heathen, uh, 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 heathen religions or any such thing. You are dealing with something else completely. You are dealing with people's innate nature. Even a person who is probably a priest, but he could be even in some sense, right? So that sort of thing. So the question is that this is a very important thing. We'll go into that. Now when we talk about then the next thing is is real, right? Real, for instance, the awkwardness of the real. See, if his films are awkward. You find the real situations are very awkward. One of the things about cinema, what cinema does by and large, is to, to sort of flatten out the awkward. Yeah, why? Okay, this is an interesting question. He was not using actors. Why did he know, know this? But the point is, when you go and see the movie, right? When you go and see the movie, that man's face is assignable to that man, no? When you see the movie, the question is, he does show faces. You can't have a movie without faces at all. But the faces will be used, it will be used where? It will be used in the, to tell you that it is Jonah Novak doing this, it is this guy doing that, right? Okay. The point is, he wants us to take, I'll come to that a little later, I'll uh, try to uh, speculate on that aspect, uh, Anjan has said, I'll just try to speculate on that aspect uh, a little later, okay? But the point here is, the real is awkward, right? Love scenes, for instance, love, you take this thing of love scenes in movies, they try to remove all the awkwardness out of love, right? There's a lot of awkwardness in love, right? They try to remove all the awkwardness out of uh, love in movies. So, Bresson is not going to do that. Bresson makes it awkward. Okay, he'll keep that awkwardness in stay intact, right? It, it's a question of, you know, to catch that moment in, in, its, in, its, in its truthfulness. And you understand my point, okay? That yes. awkwardness in Bresson is intentional. It is always there, okay? Whereas you will come across majority of movies, they can't bear that awkward moment. Okay, they can't bear that. Yeah. Bresson will naturally keep the awkward moment in some way and make sure it's not awkward cinema because there'll be there are moments that are completely you know what is the word luminous in their uh, content. I'll uh, describe them as we go along. So the question is that awkwardness he will not even out it one he will not remove it from the films. Okay, and the films are cold. Okay. His films are, are cold, they're not like Bergman or Fellini, which is full of emotions. If the emotions are there, they kept on the cycle. All of us, you know that in real life, okay, we don't want to reveal our emotions in some sense. Because revealing your you know, emotions in some sense then makes you vulnerable to other people, right? The whole business of life is you're going to meet people, you're talking to people, and there's always this uh, struggle for power between people, right? Yes, yes. If your vulnerability is known to other people, right, it makes you in the yeah. grasp of that person, it makes you in the grip of that person. So it's very difficult. We try to avoid showing emotions because, uh, uh, sort of, shall we say, uh, revealing of emotions makes us weaker. Okay, so the question is 
Preston will respect that as well. He will not uh, show overt emotions. Everything is cold. Everything is hidden. Everything is hidden from sight. He rather it's like showing the tip of the iceberg. You know that nine tenths is underneath, but all of it is under water. Okay, one tenth is above the thing. He's not going to show you. He's going to show you effects. He's not going to go looking for causes, right? That kind of thing. He's not going to tell you. You imagine the causes. That's one of the things, right? There is no suspense in this film. You take something like a condemned man escapes. If you take something like condemned man escapes, mm -hmm. the very fact that the title says the condemned man escapes, there is no suspense there. There is no suspense. You know that he's going to escape, right? The point is, why is he doing this? He is not going to allow you to anticipate things. The drama, to remove the drama. He wants to get to the truth of a certain thing. He will, anticipate, he will remove you from, uh, uh, prevent you from anticipating certain things. What happens in stories are that uh, a lot of stories, you spend so much of your energy trying to anticipate what will happen next, that you don't notice what is happening on the screen, right? Or what is going to happen next? What's going to happen? What is going to happen? That kind of thing. Pressa wants to prevent that uh, eventuality by concealing things from you, okay? No suspense, no drama from his films, okay? He's making movies in a, uh, in a, some kind of you know, visual shorthand, getting, getting past this thing, as I said earlier. So he, he doesn't really show you, he won't go show you the whole thing. He'll go through certain things without showing you the entire drama, right? That spectacle will be avoided. That spectacle of, uh, of action, of violent action especially, will be avoided. He will do that. Okay. Can we go to the next? Okay. Let's look at Ohazar Balthazar. Okay. Ohazar Balthazar is the easiest film because you've got a donkey there which is not acting. The monkey, donkey is not acting, obviously. So it's not an actor. So the donkey's conduct can be seen as reality, unmediated reality. And everybody else started in relation to that donkey. So the presence of that donkey makes that film a little easier than in other films where uh, the Bressonian uh, understatement will sort of prevent you. So the donkey is shown in that way. Okay. Now what is this thing it's about? It's about this donkey which comes into contact with various people. And the point is various characters. So let us look at this. My own understanding of Ohazad Balthazar is some kind of Dostoevsky. And I don't know how many of you have read Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky's got this huge array of characters, all of them completely different from one another, and then like extraordinarily, you know, evil, comic, okay. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things. Balthazar is a kind of demonstration of what is possible to do Dostoevsky in the traditional way with this. With this. The donkey itself is, I don't know, any, any of you have read uh, Crime and Punishment? Who has read Crime and Punishment? Okay, nobody. Has anybody read it? Crime and Punishment, uh, you have a look at this. There is this uh, stupid woman by the name of Lisa Vita. Lisa Vita, she is. She's uh, the money lender. Uh, she's uh, killed by Raskolnikov. You know in what, what Crime and Punishment is about? This guy acts as the money lender. He kills the money lender and his uh, half witted sister. This donkey is like that long suffering half, half witted sister who actually is in no, I mean, is no brainless, saintly but brainless. She's so, I mean, he's a saint because he has no brain. He keeps on, you know, doing all kinds of whatever it's made to do, it will do. Okay, that is the basic thing about this donkey. Then you've got this wicked choir singer, uh, Gerard, right? Extremely wicked. To give you an example of his wickedness. Then there is another guy. This girl, the, the protagonist is called Mari, right? Mari. Very self-willed. Some kind of victim, but at the same time capable of being cruel. For example, I tell you, and there is a stingy guy, you know that stingy fellow, the guy who uh, owns this, dog, uh, this uh, donkey for a brief while. Okay, he's so stingy. To give you, I mean, give you, I mean, this stuff you could miss uh, in terms of story. That the donkey is given a sack of oats or something to eat, right? When it's eating, this fellow takes away the sack so that he can keep it for the next day or some such thing. He doesn't allow the donkey to eat it because he's stingy. He's not going to give, allow the donkey to eat as much as it can. Okay, he's going to feed it enough. For it to, to do its uh, whatever uh, grinding, that whatever uh, oil, oil seeds or some such thing is grinding, or the wheat or something is grinding. That's all its purpose is, right? He's not going to give it more. And this fellow, he, I, I think he tries to make passes at this Mari. I remember this. And Mari has complete contempt for this fellow. He gives her, tries to give her money or something, and she throws it back at him or something. So he puts it back in his pocket. <laughs> that thing of protecting that money is more important to him, okay, 
then the fact that the humiliation of having your money flung back at you doesn't bother him at all you give her and give somebody money that person throws the money at you you take it to put it back in your pocket you don't want to lose that money that's the basic thing right this gerard who okay, can't as a drunkard that were drunkard fellow who comes into some money i don't know if you know that when he gets when he gets uh, drunk he gets violent immediately he wants to beat that donkey remember that thing he wants to beat up that donkey when he gets drunk okay i have any all of you seen the movie you are familiar with the movie yes 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 okay all right he tries to beat up that donkey he went immediately the donkey sees this man uh, coming and after a drink the donkey starts running the donkey knows that it is in for a hard time okay this character comes there and he comes into some money he is a he is a tramp he comes into some money he offers to offers to stand a party to all of them in a bar or so in a pub this gerard because that guy is paying climbs up on the counter and breaks all the glasses there so that one will pay okay now what could be the motivation for this right is just pure evil right i mean just the thing of making other people suffer that but that basically that gerard thing this is evil i mean it's unmotivated what kind of thing is this he's going to pay let's break everything and let us destroy the whole place so that fellow will uh, pay for it that fellow sitting there drunk and he's paying going to pay for it i mean this is the kind of stuff that dostoevsky does in dostoevsky the brothers karamazov okay there is this guy called smirdyakov this smirdyakov is actually the cook or no servant or something in the karma he is actually illegitimate son of the older karma karamazov he amuses himself by you know the starving dogs are all over the place he takes bits of bread or bun or some such thing puts a bent pin into that bun and throws it to starving dogs so it follows the bun and that pin gets into and this is what the way he abuses himself this is a dostoevsky character okay uh, gerard could very well be that character that that thing of pure evil pure this thing of no you know and, you know, and not only that let us uh, understand this right these are not concoctions we have seen people like this right in our in our everyday life you have seen people like this they are not motivated by greed they are not motivated by desire they are not motivated by anger they are not motivated by you know by ambition nothing simply you know do things right so gerard belongs to that category when you got the stingy character the stingy character who is i mean and mari for all her the fact that she is a victim he treats that fellow he calls him ugly and why so he calls you are ugly tells that stingy fellow the stingy fellow is want one sexual favors from mari she calls him ugly okay and though in spite of being a king she is extremely cruel to that fellow okay so the point is that regardless of what they are everybody except the donkey seems to have agency and the donkey stupidity is demonstrated in a scene where this gerard ties some crackers to its tail right you remember that scene he tries crackers to its tail and sets it on fire this donkey takes some time before it realizes it thinks its ears go up it thinks there's some something wrong somewhere then it realizes what is wrong is its own tail which has been set on fire with those crackers right i mean it takes such a long time for the donkey to figure out that its tail is on fire okay so basically it's that it's that plain stupidity at the same time saintliness it does this it is completely without doesn't it has doesn't have agency it's completely saintly so it's a, a saintly not in the, in the christian that sense of so the person that uh, his saintliness comes from the fact that he's completely harmless in the middle of all these people with agency right so this is the thing mary's mary's father is a and mary also see look at the kind of things mary is in uh, that does that the other guy i forget his name philip i think his name is i'm not sure that philip's father owned the jacks. farm he gives it to mary jacks. sorry is is it jacks i don't know i was actually i don't know i think so but mari again self destructive would prefer this gerard who is a scoundrel to that uh, well well meaning boy who is also better looking than gerard she prefers this uh, gerard okay she prefers this mean uh, dirty fellow okay to that uh, good boy who is actually well meaning and nice but she doesn't have any opinion of him so the question is i mean the kind of stuff you have that team i think the raper or something she's covering naked in the corner of the room and all these fellows are throwing stuff for their clothes the clothes or some such thing i mean that way you know the way it is shun casual air fellows throwing one by one few part of her dress and other part is just throwing around all this gang of hoodlums okay and that's actually she has gone to meet gerard as some kind of twist and this gerard has brought his whole friends along 
I mean, it, it, it is absolutely cruel the way uh, they get treated. Mar- so, Mario also, also dies, I think, at the end, no? Yeah, yeah. So, I was just, uh, you know, wondering that, is there a relationship between donkey and Mari? Like, are there two parallel stories? Because it's both possible like, in some way. It's possible. To, how are you going to read the parallel? I don't, they're not very similar. This is where people say, Mari is not a victim, I'll say that. She has her own thing. She, she can be cruel. She's a completely different thing. She's the, she does not uh, does not resemble the uh, donkey as far as I can make out. Okay, she's a victim and she suffers like the donkey. But maybe there's a difference between animal suffering and human being suffering. There is something on agency and that sort of thing, right? So finally, for all the things, she's also self-destructive. The donkey is not self-destructive. Okay, it could be a comparison, but it is not to say that they are similar. They're not quite the same thing, right? So this is the question. See, the question is that these people are all on different planes of understanding. She's not a fool. She's not. She's not stupid by any means. She's not a fool. She's not. And she's she's wanton in many of her acts. She does all kinds of things. She takes decisions which are uh, uh, self. I don't know if you've read Dostoevsky's uh, The Idiot. The heroine. One of the heroines. There are two heroines in Idiot. One of the heroines is very self-destructive, insulted and humiliated. Is another Dostoevsky novel. A very self-destructive woman who does everything wrong, picks the wrong guy, just so that in order to hurt herself. You've come across self-destructive people in your own life. You've seen that. They can't help themselves at all. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, obviously, that's the idiot. That, that, uh, that woman character is there. Self-destructive again, right? But Dostoevsky is very verbose. There's a lot of articulation going on. Bresson will not do it. Bresson will not be verbose. He will not articulate. Yeah. I don't know, like, I don't know, but uh, yeah, Balthazar is, uh, is long. Well, only why it's, uh, one, one and a half hours is long actually for a Bresson film. His films are usually 70 minutes, 75 minutes, that kind of thing, right? Okay. So the question is, yeah, this should be. So I would say that this is the closest that he has come to creating a Dostoevsky in universe, uh, in all hazard Balthazar. And uh, we understand each of them as different characters. And it's also in many ways easy because of that. It's not like his other movies. The other movies, there's one person and there's that sort of thing. Here it's very different from his other movies. Can we go to the next slide? Now, Bresson's Bressonian film. Now, these are the films, I think, you know, which are really difficult films as far as, I'm, as, far as I can understand it. Okay. They're difficult films. What exactly is trying to do? Let's take the trial of Joan of Arc. The film was actually made with transcripts of uh, Joan of Arc's trial. Okay. They were actual transcripts. There is no amount of drama added. He got some actress to play. Okay, so whatever she says is recorded by somebody. It's banal actually. Whatever is asked and whatever she says is banal. It's being recorded. Uh, thing. The important thing you must remember here is Joan of Arc here is not an inspired soul. Okay, you know the story of Joan of Arc. At some point, she lost those religious uh, thing. They didn't come back to her, and the reason the thing was. That she lost that entire inspiration and she was arrested at that particular time, right? And she became like anybody else, she became an ordinary person. This is the thing. So, this Joan of Arc in this film is not the Joan of Arc who led the armies against the enemy. She's a depleted Joan of Arc. She's depleted. She's no longer like what she was at one particular time. She's not receiving divine guidance anymore. Okay. The trial is banal. She's an ordinary person. Whatever is said is banal, is recorded, right? It begins again with that mother coming and that you, should, you could see the beginning of uh, Rivet's uh, Joan of Arc also. It's an interesting film. Very good also. You need not, there are two parts, uh, Jack Rivet's uh, Joan the Maid. So the beginning, the opening is very good. The mother coming out and speaking out the thing about Joan, take whatever the mother's uh, uh, account of Joan was. It's recorded as a kind of thing and it's very interesting the way Rivet goes about it also. But this is it's the same thing. It begins with the mother's uh, a statement about Joan of Arc, what happened to her, what was the story and all that, right? So the question is, there are no close-ups here, okay? The kind of things you have is Joan of Arc here, lying there, fish bones in a plate next to her, don't show her face, okay? Her meager belongings are in a sack, okay? All this sort of stuff, right? Now the point is, I don't want to go too much into this film, but at this particular point, Okay, and in uh, Diary of a Country Priest, I want to know what exactly it is. Uh, okay, so no, this point, 
how when she dies at the uh, on on the stake when Joan of Arc dies on the stake, what is it she does? She doesn't cry out. She coughs. She coughs because of the smoke, right? So the question is again, okay, it's a bodily response. It's not a response of the individual, right? It's a bodily response. So he's trying to remove that entire thing of emotion and all that from the thing. What is the person likely to do when actually, you know, dying at the, at the stake? I mean, ordinary person dying at the stake. She's an ordinary person. Now ordinary. She wasn't ordinary once upon a time. She's ordinary now. And she's uh, being burned at the stake. And those people are, you know, staking, uh, stoking the thing with, the, with those crosses or whatever, holding it up while she dies or some such thing. And the point is her eyes are watering because of the smoke. I mean, look at the way this thing is constructed. Your uh, dryer film will not do this at all. Dryer's film is dramatic. Burning at the stake is dramatic. Here it's absolutely without drama. She's being burned. She, and finally at the end of it, she's completely burned to cinders, right? You see that uh, thing there. The chains are there. She doesn't exist anymore. It's just a pile of ashes. Actually, she was burned, this film. It's not a, it's not a dramatic thing. She's actually burned. I'm not happy. I, I don't know what he did. But the point is, you still have to express some kind of uh, optimism with regard to her death, right? So I think that's what he does with the with the pigeons on top. I'm not happy with that pigeons thing he has done on top, but I don't know what he could have done to suggest some kind of thing that Jono, Jono Marx uh, is not somebody simply being cremated, right? Or simply, somebody simply being burned at the stake. That there is something, you can't take something like Jono Marx, you can't take, for example, Gandhi's assassination, and show it's an old man being killed. You can't show it like that, right? It has a certain political meaning. It has a certain spiritual meaning. It has a certain meaning. It has a certain meaning for everybody. So you have to raise that to some other level in some way. So Gandhi's assassination can't be shown as a... I mean, if Bresson had done this, he would have had to show some way, some optimism that this man was a great man who died, right? You can't just show it in any way, any which way. The same thing with Joan of Arc. You can't simply show her being burned at the stake. You have to express some, that meaning has to be given, but what happens is it goes against his own thing. But how he could have done it, I don't know. You can't show, you, because what happens is if you show Joan of Arc simply being burned, what are you doing? You're saying like anybody else, she's burned at the stake, it didn't mean her life, didn't have any meaning. You can't say that. She was important in history, she was something, it was a very important thing. So, you have to show, so, so he showed those pigeons sitting on top. You remember that scene? Yes, yes. Sir. The pigeons, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just but, the, but the point that. is, I wonder what if he could have done, okay? So this yeah. is the, basically the thing about uh, Joan of Arc. Any questions? Sir, just yes, I think already you would have seen this one. Okay. Just one sir, question. Just one the chains, question. We're dragging her down. Can you speak out a little loudly? Yes, sir. Just one question related to this, sir. Uh, we also see the English, you know, through the small holes. Yeah. You know, through the stones. What is their relevance and showing them in that light, sir? Why through the... the English were responsible for her death, no? Yeah, but why through the, you know, uh, this thing, through small holes? You know, they are never shown in a broader picture. I think the, if you remember right, finally it was not the English who took responsibility for her death. Okay. She was tried by her own church. The English were watchers and they were manipulating things. But the, so the question is, the English were uh, not directly, they were not judging her. For example, Bishop Conchon, I think his name was, okay. The guy who actually sentenced her, he was French, all of them were French, okay. The British were behind the scenes in some way, right. We know that the British were behind the scenes in Joan of Arc's trial. They were not, it was all in French, it was not in English. I think one, uh, I think one question is asked in English also. But by and large, they're all in, uh, they're also the question is behind the scenes. I don't think the, the I think it's true to history in the fact that the British were not directly involved, but they were manipulating things behind it. The puppet uh, court or the puppet church or something uh, tried her and sentenced her. And she was, it's just as you know, it's like this, okay. Who's the other person? Uh, okay. Yeah, for, for instance, the Nazi, uh, I think when they invaded France, who were the guys who were basically, you know, arresting the French, arresting these uh, Jews and all that. And, Sending them up to Germany. There was the French police, not the Germans, right? The, the French were employed by the Germans in some way. They were the occupied France. So it was basically all this stuff about maintaining law and order in Paris and all that was done by the French police. So the question is, they don't, you know, it won't be the, the Germans themselves. 
should not be the British themselves who did it, but the British would manipulate things so that you'd be punished, that kind of thing, right? That would that is my understanding of it. Okay. And then when we go to the diary of a country priest, the whole thing is of this priest who has genuine re religious uh, dilemmas. Okay. The, the kind of uh, community in which he's uh, supposed to administer to that community is basically not a uh, not a community which has any faith in this man being able to do anything. His hierarchical position is fairly low, right? He uh, drinks wine for some particular reason and then he gets addicted to wine. That wine is actually some kind of poisonous stuff. It's a very cheap wine which he's been drinking, right? So the point here is his epileptic fit. You see that, you know, that, uh, that some, he has, you know, sometimes he has these moments when he says something, guesses some particular thing as a result of which he's seen as, for example, he guesses that that girl is a suicide note in her pocket, right? From the way she talks. When he says that, you've got to me or note that your girl immediately, you know, is startled. How did you know? The devil, somebody says you must be the devil, okay? So that the, the, the countess also is some particular way or unhappiness with her husband, philandering husband. So basically, whatever he does, the, the husband hates this man. He doesn't care. He doesn't even look at him. When everybody comes dressed in, uh, you know, to the funeral of the countess, okay, dressed uh, very uh, in a very formal way. This man goes with his hair all, you know, uh, you know, his clothes are uh, ragged. His the clothes are not clean uh, properly. Thing. He goes in there to look at the woman and to you know pay his last respects. Nobody pays attention to him. Okay, this is the priest basically, and he's been drinking this. So the question is that he is actually some kind of, you know, he is, you know, it's a, there is one scene in which uh, the, the, the stone thing is dressed with some, you know, some hangings have been put up or something uh, decorated in some way. After that religious event is over, they removed it's a stone thing. So basically, it's a cold stone edifice. So basically, the fact is that it seems to be that, uh, that the church is actually a hindrance in your seeking salvation seems to be the, the moral of that uh, moral of that thing is anti-religious in some way that finally this man finds salvation nobody else has any faith in him nobody has any belief in him he lives in some cold environment he's not respected nothing he's a young fellow he's been drinking and finally when he has his epileptic fit once again like the idiot Dostoevsky the idiot epilepsy is taken to be some kind of uh, visions of some sort okay they could be visions because he has all kinds of things. The other person tells him you are pickled in alcohol, you have been drinking, drinking all the time, you are uh, you're, you're really nothing because that stuff you've been drinking is really third rate stuff. So what you are saying are basically hallucinations brought on by alcohol is what he tells him. Okay. So it's basically, you know, it's that thing of, you know, of religious doubt that finally all is grace, you see, I mean, it's a big struggle for salvation. He has faith, he's a believer, but the kind of milieu he lives in, the church he's working for, the other priests are all you know, cynical people. They're all trying to do something or the other. This chap has faith, but that faith is really not amount to very much. Okay. It does not amount to very much in the sense that where does it get him? Does, what, does he have religious uh, deliverance of some sort? No. That seems to be of doubt anyway. So it's an extremely, I would say, it's an almost a very anti-religious film, Diary of a Country Priest. In some sense, right? That there is really no hope that with your, within the church that... Uh, you remember that scene when he's trying to talk in a class, this little girl goes yeah. on with her hand uh, up and down, she keeps doing this. And this uh, guy takes interest in that little girl because she's the only one who's able to answer questions. He calls her and then uh, asks her and she says, she says, you have beautiful eyes. She's actually making a pass at him. Okay. This little girl who's not even 12 or something is making passes at him at this man and embarrasses him no end. Okay, it's almost like Reagan in uh, Exorcist, that girl who can make a young girl who can make sexual, uh, you know, passes at uh, religious people. Okay, it's almost like that. It's almost, you know, it's a, it's a thing of, uh, I wouldn't call it evil, but it's a, it's a certain, you know, it's un, unheard of, this kind of thing. A little girl is saying up in class and finally you've got beautiful eyes is making a pass at him. I mean, can you imagine this, this, this kind of stuff is actually, you know, quite scary that, you know, what he brings into the scene, okay? So finally, you could say that the church is a hindrance. And I would put the prison in the man escape approximately in the same position as the church. It is something to escape from. It is something, it's a hindrance in your way. It's an obstacle in your path. 
what the church is in dairav uh, country priest the prison is in manuscript okay here the entire thing is towards freedom how you get out of this how you do this how you you know escape from there from confinement there also it's confinement it's spiritual confinement because you you have no way of you know you're trying to find your way out of this in some uh, thing using the teachings of the church you can't make your way out you're stuck there somehow you do something and you die in uh, some way at the last you see all is grace in some kind of you know which is in your head the some kind of thing that you really something nobody recognizes it is not worth anything that kind of thing here it's actually more optimistic that you actually get out of it in some way you go on struggling struggling you maybe that man maybe the priest actually being alone there and saying all the all is grace yeah, i think one woman or the landlady or somebody has some faith in this guy right so the point is that uh, that there is some salvation for that guy in spite of all this positive in some way here also this chap has salvation when he climbs out of his jail or whatever and he manages to escape the entire thing of incarceration i don't think it's been done uh, you know incarceration spiritual physical kind of incarceration cut cutting your way sharpening your spoon do this and that i mean this is a this this kind of thing i mean i've never seen you remember that thing when they're standing in line he has to communicate to the other that person is uh, i think an italian or so orsini i think his name is orsini yes so yes it is yes. almost impossible yeah. to communicate your titan from all sides you can't say anything i mean it's uh, the the abita I, mean, i would say that from among the greatest condemnation escape is one of the greatest i think all three history are among his greatest greatest films but still not mysterious you can still understand these movies right they are not mysterious like the last films okay so the point here is i want to make this point i think uh, anjan singh uh, is very important okay this quotation from borges once again i tell you any man who recites a line from shakespeare is shakespeare okay is a line okay what does that mean what do you think it means anjan can you tell what do you think it means it doesn't mean anything to you any man who recites a line from shakespeare is shakespeare what do you make of that my own understanding is who is shakespeare right not a flesh and blood character okay who wrote certain things shakespeare is what we what is revealed to us through his uh, writing we don't know shakespeare as a man we know him as a writer through his writing right so shakespeare comes to us comes to us okay in his is in his writing he doesn't exist as a human being as an individual right okay my understanding of this is if shakespeare became shakespeare because of those magical lines he wrote okay doesn't the person who recites shakespeare okay and catches their magic in the uh, be put in the position of shakespeare what do you think right doesn't he become shakespeare okay so the question is what bresson is trying to do is he is trying to recreate this entire uh, this entire thing of joan of arc making that woman who plays as the model actually replicating the whole thing of joan of arc again in some way he is trying to make her joan of arc create that magical moment somehow of that particular you know it has to do with that that's why balthazar's balthazar is different here it all revolves around that moment of the trial right uh the trial of jonavak revolves around that trial that you have a country priest is around you know it is a small thing right the question is when you do that when you replicate this whole thing in this completely minimalist way when you're not going to add add to it in any way take that particular thing of a story take that whole thing and then create that thing in such a way that you're actually replicating that magical moment right okay by repeating a line from shakespeare if you're going to reproduce shakespeare aren't you reproducing shakespeare if you recite a line of shakespeare with great the conviction right have you become for that particular moment have you become shakespeare right so the question is but but if you have to they have the actress and give them the importance give their close ups of their faces important even if they are model the point is we will always be misled by the model by the actor playing that part into believing that you are you are recreating that this is not a recreation of the same thing it is not an enactment of the same thing it's an actual you know, shall we say creation of the jono work of that particular moment am i making any sense it's like you know i tell you how to put it you know passion play right a passion play um they try to have enact the crucifixion of christ right when you enact the crucifixion of christ that person who is trying to uh, trying to play christ in that particular thing gets into a trance of some sort and becomes christ you get my point right 
Okay, he actually becomes Christ. Okay, the Christ-like thing enters him. He's not he's not an actor playing the role of Christ anymore. It's a kind of release by which identification of some sort by which that thing of Christ gets into you. You get my point, right? So it's the same thing. It is it is what uh, Bresson is trying to do here is create that kind of situation where Joan of Arc actually re reappears. It's difficult to sort of understand how this is. But when you create it in the, with that kind of thing, you know, with that kind of faith, that kind of belief that you're doing it, you, you feel that you're actually, when you're watching the movie, the effect he wants is, this is Joan of Arc. It is not the way you say that um, uh, the fellow who plays, what's his name, uh, the person who plays Abraham Lincoln in that movie of, uh, okay. I'm saying when you say a person is actually that person, when you say Peter O'Toole is Lawrence of Arabia, you're talking, you're saying he's very convincing as Lawrence of Arabia. You're not trying to make Peter O'Toole actually Lawrence of Arabia. Here, okay, there is actually a kind of identification between the, between the role and between that person in such a way. It's not that that person is feeling that, but when you photograph and put it across this model with hands and feet, and that two hands are erasing the difference, the way of showing hands, for example, the most emotional uh, scenes will be hands and feet. He dragging her uh, thing to the chains. Daniel Day Lewis, right? If you say Daniel Day Lewis is uh, Abraham Lincoln, you don't mean the same way that the woman who plays Joan of Arc is Joan of Arc, right? It's not the same thing. Okay. So the question is, so the so the point is, you're actually bringing some kind of spiritual equivalence between the model, okay? And the thing by using, especially by using in the most emotional scenes, not her countenance, not her face, but her hands and feet, which are not assignable to the actor or to the Joan of Arc. We don't know what Joan of Arc's hands were like, what her feet were like. You get my point? Am I making sense? It's not an easy point to understand, okay? But the point there is, just as in the passion play, there's an effort for, I don't know, I don't know this passion play, there is a... I think Andre Rublev, that scene of the, you know, the snow, the Jesus uh, being, you know, taken for a crucifixion and all that. In Andre Rublev, there is the, uh, the, uh, I think the passion of Saint Andre or something. There is one, one uh, segment in Andre Rublev. That's a passion play. When actual uh, Christ, uh, the, the entire crucifixion of Christ is uh, enacted once again. And the, and the person playing Christ gets into such a, what do you say, some kind of uh, trance-like condition. That he goes through the whole thing, actually, my imagining himself as I mean, whatever it is, uh, actually becomes that, taken to be. And people will worship that person, kiss his feet, touch his, you know, they don't watch it the way audiences watch actors. Right? They actually go through that. It's actually an, it's a passion enacted. That's why it's called the passion of Jonah, passion of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And this is the passion of Jonah, and the passion of Jonah was there. This is calling the trial of Jonovas. He's not going to make those claims, but this is basically okay. This is what the thing is. Am I making sense to you, uh, Anjan? Okay. This is what this is the reason that yeah, some sort of yeah, okay, all right. Some some kind of I'm trying to make some kind of it's obviously something that the press is trying, uh, which is uh, which nobody else has tried before. He is not doing this enactment. He is trying to do identification of some sort by. Removing the uh, the reference uh, thing of the actor there from the screen, right? It's not the face anymore. And you're doing that by hands and feet, by and large. This is the way. Okay. I mean, you have to have some kind of uh, that. Bresson is working at something. What is the effect that it has on you? You have to examine the effect the film has on you, rather than to say whether he actually achieved this thing or not. This thing or not. What is the effect? Has that, does that have that effect of making a certain truth about Joan of Arc? Not a not a reportage. Not a thing. A certain truth about what Jonovac's thing was all about. Is it there in that thing that you're actually seeing that? I don't know. I mean, obviously, we can't believe in that. That it is actually Jonovac. But the point is, Ronas are not inviting belief as much as as much as some kind of recognition of a certain truth of the whole situation. Right? Well, let's go to the last slide. This is the quotation from Pascal, which Bresson was very fond of uh, thing. The heart knows its, uh, the heart has its reasons, which the reason knows nothing of. We know the truth not by reason, but by the heart is what Pascal said. And the point is, I think this is what uh, it would mean, uh, his two uh, best friends. So let's look at what, what the dental woman is based on this poor girl who marries this money lender who loves her. But what is the reason, what, what do you make of the reason for her treating her with no love? Dostoevsky's story is there, it's a monologue from that man's point of view. He goes on monologue. The husband after the wife's death, he 
is giving this monologue. Here, the wife has committed suicide. What is the reason for this man to treat her cold? Why does he do that? What is what is your understanding of that situation? I thought about it for a long time. Uh, does anybody have any idea at all? What is the thing? I mean, try to look at your own uh, in the sense of uh, you, you watch people around you, watch your own relations, reaction. Haven't you seen? Um, I don't know. My own understanding is children showering a pet with love after withholding it. Haven't you seen that? A dog will treat a dog when that dog looks very, you know, the looks very, very, you know, uh, forlorn or something for being for being hurt for no reason at all, right? Children do this. Then you shower it love and the dog is happy, right? That it's been, uh, then you, right? You, I don't know if you've seen this. I used to do this as a boy, right? This kind of thing. You have a dog, you don't ill treat it as much as withhold love in some way, okay? So when that love is withheld, withheld at some point, and then later on you shower it with love and the dog shows so much gratitude. For the, I think this happens everywhere, okay? I think in new relationships. Here I think this man is the withholding love treating her very coldly, treating her though he loves her, treating her very this thing that at some point he's going to shower her with love when he can afford to do it or some such thing. But the point is that when he decides to give her uh, love, it's too late. Okay. The world itself has become cruel. So uh, it's no longer possible for him to do anything. Right. So finally, that that, that, that really uh, she is seen when she's, her head is lowered into the coffin. Okay. And the lid is put on, and those the screws are tightened around the coffin. On the so you know that whole thing of death. I don't think death, you know, the thing of irreversibility of death, has been made so eloquent as in uh, this gentleman uh, this uh, with this film of uh, okay. so the question. This is my understanding of it. This whole thing of quenching her, uh, you know, quenching her enthusiasm after marriage in every possible way. Okay. Do this, do that, bring this picture, bring that picture, that kind of thing. But all the time, not giving of yourself, not doing this in some way that at some point, a later stage, some kind of thing will break away the barriers. That the barriers, when broken at that particular time, will be so away that a flood of love will come. You know, this sort of thing. Does that make any sense to you? Does that make sense to you? This is my understanding of the movie. Okay. Yeah, that that scene, for example, look at, I mean, look at the way he sets it up. It's not, it's not in Dostoevsky. That scene where he has that uh, fellow in the next uh, seat in the movie theater has his hand on her knee, right? How does she do? She turns to him and looks at him. So what does he do? He doesn't bash that guy up. They just exchange places and sit there. Okay, they just exchange places and sit there. After that, because the other guy sees that there is some uh, possibility here of uh, that this relationship is strained. This is the time we can, uh, that kind of thing. He's got the other man has got something. So then they go, the other man follows for a little bit, watches them from a distance and they get into the car and drive off. You remember that scene? Okay. So this is, I mean, this entire thing of, I think it's a fantasy of giving love at the right moment. Okay. That, that you can break barriers, you can do this. It's some kind of thing, you know, it's a, probably a fantasy of, you know, of unilaterally withholding love in some way, as you know, that you, love is yours to give as and when, when you want, that sort of thing. I don't know exactly, this is the way I see it. But I mean, the fact that it's compelling. You know, what what, is, what do you people think? Does this uh, explanation make any sense to you? Does it make any sense to you? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is my understanding of it. Let's look at last film, Larjon. Okay. You've seen the film. All of you seen Larjon? Yes. It's probably the most difficult film. Probably the greatest. In that scene, this uh, you know that that uh, when his wife leaves him, it's com completely without you know in despair. Okay. His daughter has died of diphtheria. I like that wonderful scene in which all of them are reading that letter and then they're, you know, putting it back to uh, other inmates in the prison. And then this, uh, he, he's, he hits somebody, gets into something. And that scene in uh, solitary confinement, when you hear the, that uh, uh, cup, which is being rubbed on the stone floor, and then you don't realize what that sound is. And then you see this man is lying there and, uh, you know, he is uh, rubbing that uh, cup on the stone floor. See, these these, these are moments, you know, this, this kind of moment, you know. You will not get in the cinema of any other filmmaker, this kind of, you know, that that noise which is going on in his head, okay. Okay, shown by that uh, thing of the stone cup, the cup which is being rubbed, steel cup or metal cup or whatever, rubbed across the floor. It's, uh, then you comes out of jail, immediate thing is rape and murder, is the first thing he does, okay. 
And not only that, he's looking for money. He doesn't find money. He knows, even before the other person can answer, when he kills the other woman finally, what is the reason? Why do you want uh, thing? Why? What is it? What have you got to live? What are you living for? Okay. Okay. What do you want? What do you think? Do any of you understand why does he do it? Why does he kill? Is Sir, he finally, is he a good man or a bad man? I think, is it because of the frustration that he has gone in the prison? Is it because of that? Frustration, but it, is, that, is, is that a clear enough uh, thing? Uh, you can say, but what, what is, what, why is he motivated to kill all of them? He kills everybody, including the dog. Does he kill the dog? No, he doesn't kill the dog. No, he no, kills he... the uh, injured girl. He kills the whole family. He axes all of them. Yeah, yeah. So the axing thing is another, you know, Dostoevsky thing from crime and punishment. So obviously this axe, because it's so brutal, killing somebody with an axe, he uses the thing of axe. He kills her also. He kills the old woman who's befriended him also. My own um, thing is, he's always on the periphery, right? He's in the periphery, finally. And the ending also, what do you make of that, right? Okay, it's uh, that when he's waiting out, he's brought out and those people are all staring inside, right? He's on the periphery of life. He never makes it to the thing. He's always in a, like I, what, what, what Americans would call a loser. He's basically a loser. And my, my sense of it is that basically this entire thing is I see it as he's unworthy of being good. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of, shall we say, a kind of, uh, what is the word I would use? It's a kind of extreme humility, right? It's an extreme, uh, uh, it's an extreme form of humility. I'm incapable of being good. He kills because he believes himself incapable of being good, right? It's a kind of, it's a kind of abjection. Okay, I've got nothing at all, right? I can't even be good, right? So the question is, let me be ba me be bad the way I'm intended to be by 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 go by whatever, okay? So I'm incapable of being good. So he does it because he wants to be bad because he is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven, right? That kind of unworthiness. He kills out of unworth. This is my own understanding of it. There's an interesting Borges story once again. I don't know why Borges. Nobody quotes Borges in relation to this guy. There's a story of uh, Borges uh, called Three Versions of Judas. You should read the story. B O R G E S, okay. Uh, and it is uh, Three Versions of Judas, in which the three critical things of how why Judas did that is actually a story, uh, you know, interpretation of Judas. And the thing he says is that Judas, okay, you can't attribute. Judas was chosen by Christ, that he was chosen by Christ. Christ couldn't have, been, as an apostle, as a, as a disciple, Christ couldn't have made that mistake of choosing Judas. You would have known better, right? So you can't attribute to Judas things like uh, for money, that kind of thing. You can't do, okay? Betrayal for money, which is probably the worst possible thing you can think of. But he says, uh, in adultery, there is tenderness. In, in murder, there is valor of some sort, courage of some sort. He chose the sin which is most untainted by any positive virtues, which is betrayal for money. And he says the reason was, okay, because of Judas's humility, one of the stories he says is humility. He felt that the kingdom of heaven, he was not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. He chose the worst possible uh, sin, okay. Many people mortify their flesh, he says, okay, in the greater glory of God. By Judas, by betraying Christ, to, uh, sort of mortified his soul. He tortured himself by choosing the worst possible thing as a kind of uh, thing of deep humility. Okay, he was unworthy of the kingdom of God. Is basically that. So my understanding of this man is again un he is unworthy of the kingdom of God in some way. He is unworthy of being good. He kills. He does the most dastardly things, and there's no money there at all. He doesn't get anything. You can see that, right? A few coins here, a few this thing that he doesn't benefit in any particular way. Okay. He just does it, that's all, right? So yeah, my own thing is does it out of a sense of complete unworthiness. I'm incapable of being good, therefore I will be bad kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? This is, this is the way I see it. It's a kind of spiritual condition of complete unworthiness. Mm -hmm. Sir, okay. and also what do you make out of this, sir? Like he receives the counterfeit note from someone else. Yeah. And probably it passes on to someone else. How yeah. do you 
that cycle so it seems like a vicious cycle no, i think i think uh, the, the basic the basic thing is not really i mean he is not really has no agency he just is dumped into that condition is put into i mean he is never had any kind of uh, he is that never never had any kind of uh, you know he is not chosen anything he is given this is given that a series of accidents land him in that position once he lands in that position due to no fault of his he does he completely loses any sense of worthiness right okay so when he exercises when he finally exercises uh, choice moral choice it's an evil choice he exercises deliberately okay in order to be bad i can't be good therefore i will be bad i mean you know that no i don't know have you heard of jean gene g e n e t okay mm-hmm. gene went to he was in a reformatory also a great uh, french writer okay he was a chief he written a book called chief journal gene when uh, he was uh, asked the punished for stealing something as if why did you steal he said because everybody thought i was a thief okay <laughs> you get the point right okay so the question is look now we are getting somewhere right we are not dealing with psychology anymore okay we are dealing with something deeper than psychology we are not dealing with like, for example when he was when he was a boy his father ill treated him therefore as a result of that he developed a hatred of his father and he de- developed in you are not dealing with that level of psychology anymore right you are getting deeper into something else so probably you know innate nature of people or some kind of thing a deeper uh, uh, deeper spiritual condition of some sort spiritual condition need not be positive in any way it can also be negative in this particular case extremely negative spiritual condition okay this is my understanding of it that basically he is overcome by the sense of unworthiness okay deep un- personal unworthiness because of what he has gone through he feels he is un- unworthy of the kingdom of god he is unworthy of the kingdom of god of the way religious would say i am unworthy of being good therefore i will be bad this is my understanding of uh, what is his name i forget his name whatever okay this is my thing so the question is he goes on and on and on no motive nothing no money coming his way and finally the ending what is it that this man comes out of that a lot of people have not liked it kumar shan he didn't think much of the ending and saying when he come out of that uh, thing and other people are still looking at what does that mean what do you make of that okay they expect something dramatic to come out they heard that there's a murderer somewhere is being brought out when this guy comes out they think there's something more coming in it can't be this man right it can't be this okay they don't even bother to look at him when he's being led out by police when they're looking for something inside for something more dramatic something horrible you skill so many people there has to be somebody big somebody extraordinary something extraordinary coming out an ogre of some sort okay they are looking for something dramatic when they when he brings them out they don't even turn to look at him they are all looking inside for something else to come out you remember that scene the last scene yes that yes i mean quite an i mean it's extraordinary scene what to make that so finally at the end of it in spite of doing all that in spite of doing the most horrific things the killing a whole family right eight or 10 people or so four or five people mm-hmm. Of axing them, leaving a train of blood everywhere. That finally, when he comes out, he's still unworthy. He's nothing. He's nothing at all. Yeah. Nobody takes him as a person of consequence. They're still looking inside. There must be something more. It can't be this man kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. That is the way I see that film. Okay. This is this is the way I see the film. Okay. I didn't say this. I'll stop here. I hope I made try to make some sense of Bresson without relying on it. Christian, I mean, all of I mean, we can't go around this little little thing and this Christian thing. What you, what is it to me? I and uh, doesn't mean very much except from my understanding of literature, what little bit I've read in cinema. So I'm trying to make some sense of what Bresson is trying to do without going into his Christian background or whatever. He himself, he called himself a Christian atheist, I believe, which means I'd rather look at him from the atheist side. He seems to make some sense as an atheist, right, rather than a clear, like a, rather than a Christian, a spiritual atheist, if possible to be. Okay. so this is my sense yeah that's a wonderful thing sir like all those things were really wonderful you know to help okay. to understand breson yeah so just okay. uh, just two questions i had sir yeah and these were these are relevant the very first thing is like uh, breson uses a lot of ellipses which makes his films very short and very to the point sir yeah But why does he do that is it a personal style that's my first it's question personal style all right but with obviously as a lawyer he's trying to again pare it down no it's this thing of 
all extraneous things must be left out i, I wouldn't uh, i mean i wouldn't recommend that this kind of exact uh, you know this kind of exact kind of filmmaking which ozu also had but ozu is an easier filmmaker than uh, breath no? that i would i wouldn't recommend it to indian filmmakers at all because uh, one of the things is that you're dealing with too many accidents uh, too too many accidental things in indian filmmaking is my feeling i wouldn't recommend it but i would say that it's basically to pare it down to exactly what you want i want to use this word and not its distinct cousin or some such thing i want to use this image and nothing else i will not if i cannot get exactly what i want i will leave it out and just suggest it by two uh, this way and that way a b c if b doesn't tally with what i want from it i will leave out b and i'll put only a and c you get my point right this way right this is basically to pare it down to a bare minimum is basically his idea okay this is his basic thing. so that is the basic uh, thing of uh, right yeah and the second thing what i wanted to ask was most of his films are story adaptations yeah yeah and why, why is that you want to know what is your idea uh i don't... one thing let, let us let us understand one thing right okay what are the truths that finally come out from bas bas no they are not the kind of truths that you get out of the french new wave okay he is not trying to find new truths he is actually trying to bring alive those truths which are there in classical literature Okay, see, let us understand that if you take somebody like Beckett, or you take somebody like Pinter, you take somebody like Kafka. Okay, there were relatively new truths of which they weren't, or rather, they were they were not recognized. They were relatively new kind of filmmakers, whereas uh, new kind of uh, writers and all that. Who wouldn't pick Kafka? Who your uh, Bresson would never pick somebody like Kafka or Pinter or Beckett, right? He would pick out the classical people. He would pick out the oldest truths, right? he is trying rather whatever mankind knows what human kind knows very well he would try to bring that out in some way bring bring it alive in some way through this method okay because what happens what what the thing is as it gets older and older what does the truth become it becomes a cliche right okay his basic thing is to empty well known truths of cliche this is basically his view point right he wants to empty it of cliche right so this this business of emptying uh, truths out of, of their cliche uh, content uh, content of cliche would be his basic uh, end i think in all this that is why he picks uh, things he would pick uh, you know and then he would try to do it he would try to bring something new out of it but the point is he is trying to do it in a way i mean uh, to bring it afresh in some way so he will not adapt a new writer he would not adapt a new work of literature you may have to balthazar i think is his own thing It probably the one where he wrote his own screenplay, but the point is that Balthazar is very Dostoevsky in everything he does. He's taken almost like Dostoevsky's characters and put them into this uh, thing. It's actually again an adaptation of some sort. It's probably his most Dostoevsky in that way. Okay, though he's done adapted Dostoevsky in A Gentle Creature and in Four Nights of a Dreamer, which is also available, right? This is it. Okay. No other questions. Sure, sure. All right. So it's a bit stop here. Okay. So I will suggest. So thank you very much for your all of you today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. Thank you.